It is Tuesday, the 2nd of June, 2020. This is David Gauci. Dave Nagel and I welcome all of you to the 16th talk of the Business and Energy Series of Forum 2100. We are very glad that you have joined us today. We're especially grateful to Fordham University's uh, Center on uh, Social Innovation, its collaboratory, and to the Foreign Policy Research Institute for distributing this announcement of the event today uh, to their respective memberships. And if you're joining for the first time to one of these series, thanks very much for coming and please come back. We'd love to have you join us uh, for more. Our guest today is Chris Miller. Chris is Assistant Professor of International History at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. He's also the Euro-Asia Research Director at the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. He's author of two books, The Struggle to Save the Soviet Union and Putinomics, Power and Money in Resurgent Russia. He has published extensively in both the scholarly literatures and in the business press, uh, such as the Wall Street Journal. Uh, he received the PhD and the MA from, the universe, from Yale University and his AB in history from Harvard University. Today, Chris is going to be talking to us about Putinomics with a focus on Russia's energy strategy amid low oil prices. So very quickly, the format of the session, Chris will talk for 18 minutes, during which you may submit. In fact, we encourage you to submit questions at any time using the chat function. Thereafter, we'll have 10 minutes of Q&A as Dave Nagel and I shall do our best to synthesize the questions for Chris to answer. Then I shall take about one minute or so to close the session. Chris, we are delighted to have you uh, with us today. You have an audience that represents Africa, Europe, the Middle East, South America, and North America. So welcome again. The floor is now yours. Well, thank you very much, David, for that introduction. And thank you both to David and to Dave for the opportunity to speak uh, with you today. When we first began discussing uh, a potential session on Russian energy policy, I don't think we fully realized just how timely or interesting this would be. But of course, the past uh, quarter or so has been really extraordinary for Russia as energy prices have plummeted and as Russia has been facing an economic crisis due both to energy prices being low and also to the shock of COVID at home. So what I'd like to do today is to step back and to put the current uh, situation into a broader context of energy policymaking in Russia and understand how energy fits within the Putin economic and political system more generally. So first, let me start with a, a puzzle that I think many observers of Russia face. And the puzzle is this. We're often given images of Putin trekking through the Siberian wilderness, hunting bears, or Putin the spy in a James Bond-esque type situation. And there's obvious reasons for thinking of Russian policymakers in that type of image. But next to these sort of spy story uh, uh, metaphors, I think we need to understand that there's a strategy as well on the economic policy side, and a strategy in particular for dealing with volatile energy prices. And so I'd like today to put to the side some of the, uh, the, the James Bond-esque aspects of, of Russian politics and focus instead on the policymakers and what techniques they're employing to take advantage of Russia's vast natural resources wealth and do so in a way uh, that accounts for the instability in global energy prices, especially the price of oil, which is Russia's most important export. What I'd like to propose to you today is that over the past 20 years of the Putin system, and this year we mark the 20th year that Putin has been Russia's ruler, there are three pillars that have undergirded Russian policymaking for the entirety of Putin's time in office. And each of them are crucial, I think, for understanding the energy sector. The first of these pillars of Putinomics is sound macroeconomic management. Unlike many of Russia's peers that are energy producers, and unlike many previous periods in Russian history, over the past two decades, the Russian government has been laser focused on implementing sound macroeconomic policy, getting high marks from international institutions such as the International Monetary Fund for keeping inflation low, 
for keeping budget deficits limited, and indeed the budget is often in surplus, uh, and for ensuring that when energy prices have been high, the Russian government has set aside funds in a rainy day fund so that it had extra resources when energy prices fall. That's the first pillar of Putinomics. The second pillar of Putinomics is to build support for this type of, this type of fiscal and monetary policy by using energy riches to fund social payments, above all payments to pensioners, uh, who over the past two decades, until very recently, have done extraordinarily well as the Russian government has steadily increased the payouts it gives to retirees. That's the second pillar of Putinomics that has been crucial for understanding its social and political support in Russia. The third pillar of Putinomics is to let the private sector work in certain spheres, but not really in the energy sphere. Energy, also banking, are too politically important for Russia to allow to be solely in private hands. And so there's been a, a, a complicated balance that the Russian government has tried to strike between using private sector forces to make uh, industry more efficient, but also using state control to make sure that the benefits uh, of these improvements in efficiency accrue, first of all, to the government and to the political elites. These three pillars, I'd like to suggest, have undergirded the Putin system for the past two decades, and they explain the longevity of the current Russian political elite amid very volatile energy prices. Now, I mentioned earlier on that today Russia faces a, um, several months and looks likely to be at least a year of quite low oil prices and also low gas prices as a result. But it's important to note that this is far from the first oil price crash that Putin has endured. It's the third, uh, I would argue, since he first became president. And Russian history has many more oil price crashes from the years before Putin uh, took the presidency. The most recent period of low oil prices before the present day was in 2014 and 2015. And here we have the oil price uh, visible on the slides, which crashed from over $100 a barrel at the beginning of 2014 to uh, almost a third of that level by uh, late 2016. And what's remarkable, I think, looking back on that period is how easy it was for the Russian government to adjust to this period of low oil prices. When you look at Russia's government today, they're essentially trying to replay the exact same playbook that they used to create effect in 2014 and 2015. Now, why was it so easy for the Russian government to adjust to low oil prices last time? And will this method work again? What's striking about the last period of low oil prices is that it was accompanied at the exact same time by US and European economic sanctions on Russia, which were imposed for a separate reason due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but hit at the very time that oil prices were crashing. The sanctions had several features. There were limits on Russian firms' ability to raise capital in Western capital markets. There were limits on the uh, export of advanced drilling technology uh, to Russia from the US and Europe, and Russia retaliated with its own bans on importing uh, food and other supplies from the West, which Im increased the economic cost on Russia. And the combination of low oil prices and sanctions coincided with, with what's always been a very weak business climate within Russia, as different oligarchs and business leaders are expropriated by the political elite, which creates a long-term disincentive to private sector investment, something that's been the case for several decades in modern Russia. But what's striking, I think, is that when you rewind the clock back to 2014 and 2015 and understand the shocks that Russia was facing then, low oil prices, sanctions, plus low private sector business investment, what you find is that despite the predictions of many at the time, Russia's government was able to adjust with ease. There was no great difficulty that the Kremlin faced in responding to low oil prices and surviving despite the economic pain. Why is that? What I'd like to suggest to you is that Putin has been a skilled political survivor in part because he's had a very talented economic strategy. Last time the oil price crashed, under pressure, the central bank of Russia let the ruble sink. And at the time, there were many journalists who wrote articles about how the crashing ruble was evidence that Putin's own fortunes would be crashing soon. But in fact, letting the ruble decline when oil prices decline is a deliberate political strategy. The reason is that Russia's government budget depends very heavily on oil and gas taxation. Roughly half of Russian government budget revenues have come from taxing 
oil and gas. And that means that when the Russian government decides to devalue its currency versus the dollar, uh, it also uh, manages to it also manages to keep the ruble price of oil relatively stable. And this chart that I show here is, I think, crucial to understanding the political economy of modern Russia. In 2014, the dollar price of oil crashed because the Russian government let the ruble slide against the dollar as well. The ruble price of oil was roughly constant. And that's important because Russia sold roughly the same number of barrels of oil abroad in 2015 as it had in 2014. And almost all of Russia's government expenditures are denominated in rubles, payouts to state workers, for example, or payments to pensioners. What that means is that Russia's government had the same number of rubles, more or less, coming in in 2014 and 2015, even though the price of oil in dollar terms had crashed. As a result, Russia's government budget was basically balanced the entire time, despite the crash in the price of oil. It's not like in Saudi Arabia, which keeps its currency pegged to the dollar, where a steep decline in the price of oil causes a vast explosion in the size of the budget deficit. In Russia, that never happened. The budget was basically balanced the entire time, despite the declining oil price. Now, there was a cost, of course, to this strategy, but the cost was borne not by the government, but by the populace. Inflation uh, shot upwards for a year, going from around 6% uh, in 2014 to double digit rates, almost twice that uh, in 2015, but it came down relatively quickly, only imposing a year of high inflation on the Russian population. But that was enough to hit real wages, inflation adjusted wages very heavily. And even today, inflation adjusted disposable household income is lower in Russia than it was in 2013. After seven years, Russians have gotten poorer rather than wealthier, a pretty stunning economic result. But what I think is notable is that despite that Russians on average are getting poorer in inflation adjusted terms, Putin's popularity thus far has not yet been severely hit. If you look at Putin's approval and disapproval ratings according to the most credible Russian pollster, the Levada Center, you see no big shift even when oil prices crashed and incomes in Russia crashed with that. Now that's just beginning to change and the question I'd like to pose at the end is whether we're beginning to see uh, a more durable and sustained erosion of Putin's popularity. It hasn't happened thus far uh, because for a long time, Putin used Russia's oil riches to direct payments to the most important voter bloc in Russia, the pensioners. Uh, and, and as you can see from this chart, in inflation adjusted terms, pension payouts in Russia increased at double digit rates in many of uh, Putin's time in office from 2000 to 2018, there was just one year when pension payments fell in inflation adjusted terms. And in most of the 2000s, they were steadily increasing. So like in the United States and many parts of Europe, uh, pension payments are a huge issue in Russian politics and Putin has directed substantial resources, at least until recently, into keeping pensioners happy. The cost of that has been other types of social spending, investments in the future, investments in health or education have declined. Russia spends less as a share of GDP and health and education than most comparable governments uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. And that makes the decision last year to impose pension cuts for the first time in the Putin presidency very risky. And there were some protests at the time among pensioners, though relatively limited in scale. But this calls into question the second pillar of Putinomics, which thus far has been crucial for Putin's political support. Now, the third pillar of Putinomics has been uh, in operation for the entirety of Putin's presidency, and it's been a matter of balance, balancing the market uh, with the state. Many uh, Western commentators looking at Putin's Russia like to highlight the continuities between the Soviet period and Russia today. And there are many continuities, but there are also many major differences. And one key difference is that unlike in the Soviet Union, when everything was planned by the center today in Russia, most businesses are more or less left alone. They're not helped by the state very much. The regulatory climate is a mess. Taxes aren't that low, but most businesses outside of crucial sectors are, are left alone. There's no central planning today. The exception are in those sectors of the economy thought to be politically important. And the most important sector by far is the energy sector, oil and gas. And what we've seen over the past two decades is a balancing act where the central government has extended its control over uh, oil and gas companies. Uh, it owns a larger share of oil production today than it uh, has at any point 
uh, since uh, the privatization process began in the 1990s, but there's still a substantial private sector element in Russian oil and gas today, notably among the oil and gas services companies that actually operate much of the logistics of getting oil and gas out of the ground. So there's always been a balance between state and private, even in these strategically crucial sectors such as energy. Now, the exceptions are in ownership. There's examples like this gentleman, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who was uh, used to be the owner of Russia's largest oil company as well as Russia's richest man before he was jailed uh, for a decade in the mid 2000s for contesting Putin's political control. Another example is uh, this gentleman, Vladimir Yevtushenkov, who was uh, put under house arrest several years ago before surrendering his oil company to a Kremlin-linked oligarch. For people who own energy companies that don't uh, respect the will of the, the state or the will of the Kremlin, they lose control of their companies. If you own an energy company and play ball according to the political rules of the Kremlin, generally you're allowed to keep control of your company. And Luke Oil, which is Russia's second biggest energy company, uh, oil company rather, remains in private hands in part because it's been so tactful uh, in managing its relationship with the Russian government. So private ownership is possible, but only if you uh, make yourself subsidiary in political questions to the Russian state and to the Kremlin's political leaders. So this system of Putinomics, I argue, has worked quite well for the Russian leadership. It's true, as I mentioned, that for the average Russian incomes are lower today than they were uh, earlier this decade. That's true also that Russia's GDP growth is substantially lower than it could be uh, with more uh, economic efficiency and more market reforms. But for the political elites, this has worked rather well. Uh, the current elite has been in power for two decades. They've withstood a whole array of uh, geopolitical and economic shocks to the system. And from the perspective of Russia's leaders, they're quite pleased with how uh, the, this economic system has given them both domestic political stability at home and also the ability to assert themselves internationally uh, on the world stage. But there are risks ahead in Russia's uh, political system and its economic setup that I'd like to highlight as we turn towards my, uh, my concluding comments. First are the risks that we see right now as Russia faces another period of low energy prices coupled with COVID uh, at home. There's been a series of substantial changes in the Russian political and economic system over just the past couple of months. In January, Russia got a new prime minister, the first in many years. Uh, this gentleman, Mikhail Mishustin, uh, who was appointed from a position of somewhat obscurity uh, to become the second most powerful person, uh, at least in legal terms in Russia's government. In March, as you are all well aware, the price of oil fell by over half from around $70 per barrel at the start of uh, the year to uh, uh, touching uh, $10 or $20 a barrel at its lows uh, in April or May. That same month, Russia itself entered COVID lockdowns across the country, which increased the economic pain that Russians face currently. And that lockdown is just beginning to be lifted in Moscow and other cities in Russia. In April, Russia's collaboration with OPEC countries, above all with Mohammed bin Salman, uh, briefly fell apart, driving oil prices lower before it was resurrected several weeks later. And it was widely interpreted in Russia and abroad as a strategic error on the part of the Kremlin and President Vladimir Putin. In addition, there's always the risk of new economic sanctions from Europe or the United States. Uh, here's a list of the many individuals, CEOs, Kremlin officials who have been sanctioned thus far. These lists could always be expanded and there's constantly in front of the US Congress new sanctions legislation that's always on hold waiting to move forward in the case of a new foreign policy crisis. But beyond all these specific risks, what I'd like to suggest is there's a broader challenge that the Russian government faces, in particular that Vladimir Putin faces because this economic shock of low oil prices and COVID comes at a time when Putin is trying to rewrite the Russian constitution, and in particular to push through changes that would reset term limits and allow him to run twice more for the Russian presidency when his current term ends in 2024. The proposed changes would let him run for two new terms, essentially allowing him to be president until 2036, a de facto president for life. And 
by all accounts, it seems that Putin has the political popularity today and the power needed to push through these changes. But it seems to me that there are real dilemmas that the Russian government and Putin personally faces. One is that uh, all of the polling we have now suggests that Russians want change at the top. According to polls, more Russians today say that they put, put greater value on the ability to change their ruler than they do on the provision of political stability. That's a dangerous sign, I think, for the Kremlin. A second worrisome polling result recently is that most Russians support putting age limits of 70 or younger on the position of presidency. And of course, when Putin runs again for the presidency in 2024, he will be above that age limit, suggesting that most Russians would rather have a president besides Putin come 2024. The broader backdrop for this, though, is I think a question of whether the stagnation in economic terms that's been felt by average Russians is finally beginning to bite. We've seen that in the last oil price crash, the Russian government was able to implement very painful economic changes at home uh, and let the bill be paid by Russian households rather than the Russian government. Now the question is whether that strategy is facing its end. And as we look forward to Russian politics and, and also the future of Russian policy making and economic questions, we need to ask ourselves whether when Russians think about what types of economic policies they want, will they prefer to have the system that gave them this chart, the rising per capita GDP that they saw from Putin's first year as acting president in 1999 all the way to 2013, a period of economic boom in Russia? Or instead, will they remember the past decade, a period that has been marked by stagnation and declining living standards when adjusted for inflation? There's more and more evidence that the latter image is being seared into the minds of Russians and that they're beginning to blame their political leaders, the government, the Duma, the governors, but also to a certain extent Putin for presiding over the stagnation. And so I think the biggest question over Russian energy policy and economic policy making overall is whether the current system that's worked so well for the Russian elites can persist or whether as Russians put up with more stagnation in their living standards, they'll begin to blame the guys at the top for this stagnation and demand changes in Russian economic policy and energy policy, and even perhaps in their president. So I'll wrap up there and would welcome any comments or questions that Dave, David, or any of the audience have. Chris, thanks very much. Uh, there are a number of questions here. So let me see if I can kind of uh, organize them. Uh, the first one actually comes from Dave Nagel. Um, and uh, it is and not surprising, um, someone who has quite a experience in the oil and gas industry knows a lot about it. The question is about the extent to which the Russian oil and gas sector has gone full circle over the last 30 or so years. And in the, if you reflect on this, in the 1990s, after the fall of the Soviet Union, many non-Russian corporations took equity stakes in the Russian oil and gas sector. Um, and so did Russian oligarchs, as you mentioned. But during the Putin era, um, many of these arrangements have been restructured. Uh, so could you enlighten us as to what your view is of how much the current approach to managing the oil and gas sector is the same as what prevailed during the Soviet area, era and uh, how much maybe it is different? Well, I think there are, there are some ways in which we come full circle in terms of foreign presence. There's certainly been a decline in investments by Western firms into Russian energy for two reasons. One is that the Russian government has become more skeptical of any uh, ownership stakes that would give any foreign firm, Western or otherwise, uh, any semblance of control in a major Russian energy asset. There's a lot of skepticism of that among the Russian elite today. And there's a sense that Russia has less need uh, than it might have in the 1990s for foreign help. Um, but there still is a willingness, I think, on behalf of the Kremlin to cooperate with Western firms um, where Russian control isn't questioned. And I think there's no um, naivety in the Russian leadership that they still technologically let, uh, are far behind uh, Western leaders when it comes to drilling technology and also management practices um, in, in oil and gas companies. And so where sanctions have allowed it, generally, uh, Russia has been happy to continue uh, partnerships with Western firms. For example, uh, BP still owns a 20% or so stake in Rosneft, which is Russia's biggest oil firm. And that's something that is legal under 
US and EU sanctions, the Russian government hasn't really touched. There are a number of other um, places where Western firms have continued uh, partnerships with the Russian government or, or Russian uh, private firms in the energy sector. But in addition, as Western participation has been wound down uh, in, in part because of sanctions, Russia's government has gone to Asia in search of other investors. And so we've seen in the past five years, uh, substantial investments by Indian, Japanese, and Chinese firms uh, in Russian oil and especially in Russian gas assets. Uh, there's a number of reasons for this. One is a desire to raise capital. Um, two is uh, a linkage between uh, Indi I'm sorry, uh, Japanese and Chinese investments uh, and the ability to sell to the Japanese and Chinese markets. Uh, and the third is a, a sort of political reason, a desire to show that even if Western firms aren't present, Russia can get investment from Asian firms. Uh, so we've seen a sort of shift in the foreign investment profile in the Russian oil and gas sector with this decrease in Western investments, but a corresponding increase in, uh, in Asian countries' uh, investments in, in both oil and gas. Okay, you have a couple of questions here that relate to um, climate and Russian energy strategy. So I think if I were to sort of synthesize these, um, it's essentially how, have, um, how has Russia's energy strategy uh, had um, any kind of influence on policies relating to uh, climate change mitigation that we see around the world? Well, the Russian government overall is, is relatively skeptical of uh, substantial measures against um, CO2 emissions, in part because its two main exports, oil and gas, are major contributors to emissions. Uh, and so there are a, a large number of people in the Russian elite that either don't believe climate change is happening, think it's, it isn't man-made, or think it's not a problem. And indeed, there are some people in the Russian elite and uh, Russian society writ large who celebrate climate change on the grounds that it's helping melt the polar ice caps and will open up new shipping lanes um, through Russian territorial waters in the Arctic. So there's a, a real debate among Russian leaders as to whether climate change is good or bad for Russia. Um, and there's been no really significant government action um, to encourage um, a shift towards renewable energy production in Russia, uh, in part because economically it would just be uh, so challenging for Russia to do that. Um, Russia is, however, aware uh, that its largest gas customer, which is Europe, uh, is in the midst of an energy transition targeting carbon neutrality by 2050. And this actually presents uh, an interesting dynamic for Russia because increasing gas usage is actually a part of the way Europe is going to move towards carbon neutrality, shifting away from coal towards cleaner natural gas. And so there's a, a sense in which Europe's green efforts will actually, at least in the short term, uh, help sustain gas demand uh, from Russia um, because there'll be a, a shift towards uh, gas, which is cleaner fuel. More broadly, there is a, a dilemma that Russia faces, I think, which is that if you buy the optimistic story about uh, the increasing cost competitiveness of wind and solar, and you buy the sort of optimistic Elon Musk story that we're all going to be driving electric cars in a decade, uh, that's not a, a particularly positive um, view for a, a country that exports a whole lot of oil. And so I think Russia is in some ways um, at risk of a, of a more rapid than expected green transition, especially on the oil demand side. Um, but in the Russian government, the perception is that, in fact, this is mostly talk, maybe Europe will uh, succeed in decarbonizing, but the rest of the world won't. China, India, eventually Africa represent substantial uh, sources of growth in oil production. And so most people in Russia believe that there's uh, no reason to expect a substantial decrease in energy demand uh, due to green transitions in Europe or elsewhere. Perhaps picking up on that, there are a few questions here also relating to perhaps the geopolitical dimension. Uh, but um, to what extent uh, is, do you think the energy strategy of Russia plus the conditions right now, uh, how stable they might be uh, domestically, um, relate to uh, serving the demand uh, that is coming from China and India? And then how do um, players like the United States and Europe uh, respond to what's going on in Russia? Well, it's an interesting question. It depends what exactly you're looking at in terms of the market. And in, in terms of the oil market, um, because the oil market is, is so liquid, um, Russia doesn't really depend on 
um, selling to, to certain consumers versus others because it's relatively easy to get um, supply. Gas is different. Um, traditionally, uh, almost all of Russia's gas has been delivered via pipeline, and almost all those pipes have gone to Europe. I know that's beginning to change. There's been a big gas pipeline just opened up to uh, sell to China, and Russia is investing in LNG slowly, but over time it will have more and more LNG. And so uh, Russia will have more ability to sell to Asian markets over time than it does um, today. Uh, but I think the question though remains uh, whether China in particular will be as rich a gas market as Russia hopes. If you ask the Russian government, they'll talk up um, both the geopolitical and economic benefits of China's rise for Russian gas. But if you look at it from China's perspective, they can buy gas from Russia, but they can also buy from many other sources, both piped gas and LNG. And so as a result, it seems to me that many in Russia are overestimating uh, the potential for uh, further growth in the Chinese market. And in particular, they're overestimating the likelihood they are to receive high prices from the Chinese market. Because from my perspective, it seems to me that uh, China has many potential suppliers, only one of which is Russia. And so Russia has no real pricing power in the Chinese market. And so when I assess Russian uh, government spokespeople and energy company spokespeople claiming that China is the future of Russian energy demand, I say that might be true, but it doesn't necessarily look like a great economic story if China in fact has many different countries from which it can buy natural gas in the future. So I think that's more of a geopolitical uh, story than it is actually a, a great economic story for Russia. Okay. Chris, thanks so much. There are plenty more questions. So I, uh, we will encourage people to go to the Forum 2100 website to see, to get uh, Chris's contact information. Uh, if you'd like to establish a dialogue with Chris, uh, we encourage you to do so. Uh, the materials will be posted up there as well. Chris, thanks so much for taking time with us today. This has been an extraordinary, extraordinarily interesting topic, uh, one that I'm sure we couldn't give complete justice to. But um, we encourage people to pursue this uh, with you, uh, if possible. Um, as always, we shall be, uh, we have recorded this session. It'll be posted on the Forum 2100 YouTube, YouTube channel uh, within the next day. Uh, so look for an announcement of that. Um, and also, if you would, take a look at the, at the channel. There's a lot of uh, material there, a lot of resources that can be used. They're free, and you can uh, pass them around, let people know about it. Um, I would like to again thank uh, Fordham University's Social Innovation Collaboratory and the Foreign Policy Research Institute for helping us to spread the word by getting the announcement out. Uh, we look forward to uh, further collabor collaboration with them and with others as well. Um, but uh, we will be taking time off this summer. Um, if any of you have interest in presenting something, please let us know. Get in touch with either Dave Nagel or me. Or if you know of others who you think uh, could be uh, interesting presenters, let us know that too. But until next uh, September, be watching for our announcements. And uh, until then, Dave Nagel and I wish you and your loved ones to be safe and in good health and even in the moment, in good spirits too. Thanks again for joining us today. Thanks again, Chris. Bye for now.